Hello to all our learners. It's uh, great to be here with you again. This is week three feedback video and uh, as, as some of you will notice because the powers of observation are being honed so finely over recent weeks, uh, there's something different about Richard's hair today. So I'm not sure if you can pick that up. No, it's, it's uh, Sherelle who's with us again. So welcome Sherelle. Sure, thank yeah. you. It's a pleasure to be back yeah. in the studio and uh, lots of great discussion as always this week. But uh, the mm -hmm. cognitive practices in particular, mm -hmm. uh, learners really enjoyed learning about perception, presence, <laughs> acceptance and letting go yes. um, and applying that and we acknowledge that you know the lessons they're so simple in essence but mm. not easy to put into practice <laughs> and a lot of people don't realize that when we're sitting in the chair practicing the mindfulness meditation we're practicing being present we're practicing acceptance we're practicing letting go because it, it, all the stuff comes up in ourselves mm. And so it's really just um, the connection between the meditation and day-to-day -day life is just taking that out of the chair and back into our life. Sure. And the more we can do that in the chair, I think it gets easier and easier then to apply it elsewhere. And yeah. um, some nice examples, you know, some quotes that got talked about a lot. And um, we can't control the wind, but we can control the sails. I thought that really summed up, you know, we've yeah. got this difficult situation. How do we deal with it? adjust the sails right. um, and of course the serenity prayer about accepting the things that you cannot change and uh, the courage to change the things you can and the wisdom to know the difference is yes. another classic one and yes. it's Don't that discerning the wisdom. the wisdom that's a really important <laughs> part isn't it yeah. uh, well yes and there was um, some discussion as well about uh, you know it's one thing to accept when you go to your cafe and they say they're out of your favorite you know, rap or something like that. Yeah. Um, but what about when big things happen? Yeah, and it, it's not like, oh, well, forget acceptance then. It's it, it, it's the same acceptance. It's just on a different scale. Yeah. And uh, in my own life, for example, I've worked quite a lot with cancer support groups and for MS organisations. And, you know, when people are confronted by potentially debilitating or life-threatening conditions, acceptance matters a lot. But it's not so easy, um, especially initially, but generally what happens when there is a, an, an eventual acceptance is the person doesn't feel apathetic or mm. disempowered, they actually feel more empowered to direct their energies now to what they need to do, um, or just feel much more at peace with the situation that just is the way it is, because just because we're mindful doesn't mean that life isn't going to present um, sure. challenges like it could to anybody else. So it's it's acceptance. And I think if we practice acceptance with the little things, it makes it easier to bring it to the big things. Mm, definitely. And uh, another key thing that got talked about a lot was the other formal practices. Mm. Uh, in particular, this week, we had a slightly longer practice, a 10-minute practice. Um, and interesting, a few people were saying, you know, they thought that was going to be really difficult and it was easier than expected. And I just thought that's such a nice example of, you know, often when we're worrying about things, they tend to be easier than we thought. And when we're meditating, we might think it's going to be difficult and often it goes easier than we thought. So that was really great to see. And that thought, this is going to be difficult, it's just another thought to let go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how long is this going to be for? You know, it's just another thought to let go. Sure. And yeah. all those, all that commentary around what's happening, if we can just let that go, just focus on the breath, focus on the body. And mindful listening was the other practice that we really introduced yes. uh, this week. Yes, and that's right. And to, to listen in natural environments or to listen just to the ambient sounds mm. and... Uh, to realise what we often take for granted. and um, But uh, because if we're not listening to what's happening around us, chances are we're listening to a din of thinking in our heads. And um, <laughs> it's like... Uh, yeah, very noisy. <laughs> that's right. It's like uh, King Hamlet with poison pouring in his ears but, uh, while he slept. And it's a little bit like that when we're ruminating mm. in an unmindful state. And uh, so, yeah, the listening's an important sense. Sure. And interesting that some people were saying they found it difficult to listen in a noisy sort of environment. So they mm. were waiting, for example, till you know, family members had gone to sleep and try and do practice then. But some other people actually really enjoying, you know, the busy sounds of the city. It gave them things to focus on. And mm. I think there's pros and cons of practicing in, in a more quiet environment and actually being able to deal with the distractions and, and yeah. uh, not get too caught up with them um, in a busier environment as well. So both can be helpful. Yeah, and we want to be adaptable. Uh, we don't want to think, oh, well, I can only be in mi mindful in uh, some kind of completely sealed off, uh, quiet environment because... It's not you know, very you, helpful in real life, is you it? take somebody like a champion athlete who, who develops these mm. skills, it's when they're stepping out onto the court with thousands of mm. people screaming out their name and everything, and they need to be mindful in that environment. So we want to be very adaptable. Um, I was working uh, with um, police um, mm. uh, quite recently and... And, uh, you know, police stepping into really challenging situations sure. need to be mindful. Um, uh, you know, you can't go, go to some quiet place and say, you know, please stop. <laughs> Let's be calm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, you've got to think on the spot, um, be rational, be clear, do what needs to be done. Yes. 
Mm. And some other questions around the formal practice. Um, a few people starting to take the training wheels off, as it were, and, and practice without a guide. Mm. And I think particularly the mindful listening lends itself to practicing. You can add that in any time, you know, yes. going for a walk. You, you don't have to be putting yeah. uh, the, the audio recording on to do that. But a question around how do you keep track of time, Craig, if <laughs> you're doing it without an audio uh, guide? I just enjoy that sort of, that's a, like a, a little subtle internal game of just how I practice for a half hour mm -hmm. in the morning and half hour in the evening and um, and not to keep checking the clock but just to <laughs> sort of open my eyes when there's that kind of internal feeling that that's half an hour and it's surprising what an uncanny sense of time you can get but you can just have a clock visible if you're not sure just open sure. your eye if you want to or just have one of those little timers yeah. that can just uh, softly um, you know ding at the end of whatever period of time, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, however long it might be, sure. um, but that can help. Sure. And another key point around the formal practices was uh, the steps around neuroplasticity, sorry, mm. and, and recognising that um, you know, when we're training, the brain in this way, we really are changing the attention circuits in the brain and making them stronger and that was a real key motivator. And mm. another motivator that comes up sometimes is, as Craig mentioned before, you know, a significant health issue can be a great catalyst for putting these things yes. into practice. Yes, as uh, Shakespeare said, <clears throat> sweet are the uses of adversity, uh, which like a toad ugly and venomous wears yet a precious jewel in its head. And I think that um, to be able to use adversity um, mm. to grow post-traumatic growth rather than sure. post-traumatic stress um, really requires that we turn towards the situation, not try and avoid or pretend it's not there. But it's amazing what incredible growth people can have and what deep insight into themselves if they are able to be mindful in those situations. But uh, it's certainly a challenge. Sure, sure. Yeah. Again, simple, not always easy. Yes. <laughs> uh, multitasking, yes. another really key co topic this mm. week, um, and that differentiating what we think of as multitasking from a efficient attention switching. You know, that mm. was really revealing for a lot of learners. And um, I liked one learner sort of described. So multitasking is really a euphemism for continuously flitting from one thing to another, losing time and causing stress. Yes, that's <laughs> that summed it up. Pretty much sums it up. Because, and people, um, uh, our learners may be understanding as we look at it that multitasking, like a doctor who said in a program the other day, I was writing up a drug chart for one patient while I was having a conversation with a nurse about a different patient. So two different things mm -hmm. happening at the same time. And somebody else picked it up later on, but he'd written the nurse's mm. name instead of the drug name on the drug chart. Sure. <laughs> 20 milligrams of Mary taken twice a day. It's like, uh, <laughs> But that, that's different to having a conversation with the nurse about one patient or then um, uh, writing up a drug chart the next moment, then shifting attention to mm. something else where the attention's moving, um, but it's on the one thing at a time rather than that sort of bouncing back and forth. Definitely. Yeah. And um, we did have an emergency nurse in, in uh, the course this yes. run that actually gave you know some examples about in that job you've just got to be efficient with your attention switching you do need to manage exactly. multiple things at, at similar sorts of times but yes. you've got to switch from one to the other busy parents as well because yes. if not that's when errors are made sure yeah. and the multitasking experiments uh, you know later in the course really helped tease that out a bit more and did lead to a few questions around um, you know what about listening to music when studying is that simple multitasking is that complex well look, I think the operative word is listening if listening to the music, then the attention's not on the study. If the music's there as an ambient background sound, uh, then it may be removing some more intrusive sounds and it may create a kind of a calming or soothing environment, but the person's attention's on what they're studying. Um, but uh, there was an interesting study that came out, and it's one of the few that's looked at this, um, but uh, not so long ago, but looking at students under four different conditions, mm -hmm. studying in silence, studying with uh, low arousal music, so something quiet or soothing, studying with high arousal music, um, uh, so fast tempo and louder, and uh, or with ambient sound, you no know, road noise and so on. What they found was that performed best were the silence. Second best was the low arousal music. Third best was ambient mm -hmm. sound. Uh, the worst on, uh, was the uh, high arousal music. Having a great time, loving the music, you know, and everything else. Uh, air guitar, if there's any air guitar <laughs> happening, the tension's not on the work. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, sure. Yeah. And that said, you know, there are some individual differences. I think we can perhaps say from that study, you know, the majority will work well with uh, silence. I do know some people that do say they find the silence unsettling, so a little bit of ambient music um, or yeah. music noise could be helpful for some individuals. But maybe experiment. Try. Do you, do you just think you need it? Uh, could you try with the silence and see if that helps?
And I think what people are noticing is when there is silence uh, that they become more aware of the distractibility mm. of the mind. So it's a little bit disconcerting, but it's just actually unmasking something that's happening um, very often that they're not noticing. Um, and really, um, uh, but it, it operated best, but people want to be flexible and step into a quiet exam room and be able to focus. Sure. So, sure. yeah, there are a few other things um, uh, as well about productivity and um, technology. Yeah. Lots of great tips around managing productivity, um, sorry, managing technology and improving your productivity, yeah. um, to-do list prioritising, decluttering your desktops and your email. Mm. Um, a bit of a question though came up around, you know, how do you, you plan your time so that you're not thinking about what needs to be done? And you can well, be more attentive with everybody. Yeah. Learn to specifically ask for your yeah. opinion on that one, Frank. Well, yeah, I think when when we're feeling overloaded and burdened, so many things on, uh, what we're often doing is ruminating and worrying about how much we've still got to do, all the things I need to remember, don't forget this, while we're doing something. And that sort of overthinking things, that over-worrying things. I mean, making a list, for example, can be a great thing to do. But that overthinking and worrying, don't forget this, oh, I've got to do that. Oh, what about this? Will I have time for that? Kind of creates a sense of pressure. But it appears to be planning and preparation. It appears to be something useful, but it's not. It's actually just worry, yeah. <laughs> distraction, <laughs> rumination. So to just notice that and just get the attention gently back on task. And if we're most mindful, we'll recognise, good, time to stop that, now move on to the next thing. But we can do it with much less of this internal pressure we create for ourselves and much more efficient use of our energy. If we can do that, then we can maybe be a lot um, more settled and uh, not quite so exhausted at the end of a day. Sure. Mm. And the final area that really generated a lot of discussion this week was around procrastination. Lots well, of good I tips don't think, around... I, I'm not sure that we should go <laughs> on to that. <laughs> we'll save it for next week. Yeah, or maybe we'll put it off <laughs> till another time. <laughs> but just starting, dealing with something, you know, making a few minutes just to make a start on it right now to get the ball rolling yes. is great. Uh, and so next week, our final week, Craig. Yes. Yes, yeah, so um, we've got uh, some very interesting things, the emotional realm, and, mm. and it's challenging. So a few weeks under our belt to help us to sort of explore that uh, with more depth and um, uh, how to um, uh, also the mindful life and bringing it more into our day-to-day -day life and some uh, tips and resources about how to continue the practice after the course is over. So plenty still to explore. Should be Thank a great you. week. Thanks.